So welcome to our first of a series of Women's History Month, you want to say, workshop lunch series here at Essex County College. My name is Angela, Angela McKinney. I'm the director in one of the departments of the Continuing Education Community, Continuing Education and Workforce Development. That's the full title. And today, our first speaker, we have Ms. Sharon Harden from Hiller College, who I will introduce in a minute. So the initial meaning behind these lectures and workshops were designed to invite prominent women in the community to come out and share with our audience some of their experiences and how they have contributed to their success. In addition to providing encouraging words and empowering women to be the best they can be. And I also, before I go on, I want to recognize Councilwoman October Hubby, who is in the audience today. Thank you for coming. And I just can recognize also students and staff, friends and family that are here as well. Thank you for coming out today in light of the situation that's happening in our world of virus. So without further ado, as I mentioned earlier, we have Sharon Harden today, who is an assistant professor and program chair of elementary education at Phillip College. When you came in, you should have received um, a bio of her, thank you. And you also should have received a ticket, an orange ticket, that will be used afterwards for you to get lunch. And that's it. So I will turn it over. virus spread and all of the planning and work that's going into uh, our response to that by our institution. So it's a very busy time and I thank you all for being here, all students, faculty of essays. And I also want to extend uh, my sincere appreciation to Dr. Monroe, who's the president of Essex uh, County College, Mr. Bundy, the executive director of Institutional Advancement. Ms. McKinney and Ms. McClain. I thank you all because a lot of work that is preparing this series and in spite of uh, the situation that we're facing now, we're going to press forward and I hope that I say something today that will be an inspiration to all of you. You know, in my opinion, there is nothing more exciting than stimulating conversations with interest I like to say that I rarely meet strangers, and I hope that by the end of our conversation today, that we can say we are strangers no more. I just want to share with you some interesting conversation about the lives of some well-known and not so well-known women. I'm a native Detroiter, and one of my very first college classes that I took on my post-secondary education journey was at Wayne County Community College in Detroit. The course was a women's studies course, and I still remember the instructor's name, Dr. Patricia Washington, and the book, which I still have, Black Women in White America by Gerda, Gerda Lerner. Dr. Washington was not only an instructor, but she became a true mentor to me, and she shared so much that shaped my perspectives about women's studies. I share this with you because of how deeply I believe in the importance of excellent teachers and committed, caring mentors. It is also a testament to my belief in the impact of our community college system. I have taught in community colleges in Detroit, Boston, and Cleveland. And I believe that community colleges are one of the most valuable resources in our communities for affordable and accessible post-secondary education. As you heard, I'm currently a professor and program chair at Pillar College in Elementary Education. And I'd also like to thank my Pillar colleagues and students for being here today with us. So when I began taking classes at WC3, as it was called in Detroit, 
as it's still called in Detroit. I was a really shy girl, believe it or not. I was always curious, though, and that curiosity undergirded my yearning to learn. I rarely spoke to express my opinion, and I really wasn't encouraged to do so either. I also considered myself to be a car carrying nerd and a well behaved woman. But something happened in this game of life. And let me just say that in my endeavor to live a well loved and well behaved life, shall I say, I became this not so well behaved woman. And so I hope that throughout this conversation you will come to know what I mean by that. What started out as a well-behaved woman, a preacher's wife, is now a very poorly behaved woman and preacher's wife, who's not too shy anymore to speak up and speak out. I have to begin by telling you about my son Kofa journey as I began to prepare for this conversation today about what I consider to be some noteworthy attributes of visionary and courageous women throughout history. Literally translated, Sankofa is an African word of the Akan people in Ghana. The Sankofa concept means it is not taboo to go back and fetch what you forgot. So visually and symbolically, the mythic Sankofa bird is flying forward, but looking backward with an egg of promise in its mouth, symbolizing unrealized opportunities of our future. Sankofa teaches us that we find in our roots, in our past, what helps us to move forward. So simply, we gather the best of the past to achieve our future potential. In this era of shine theory, black girl magic, Me Too, Time's Up, and other feminist and womanist movements, I began the Sankofa journey to reflect on the lives of many significant women. Strong women. Women with steady shoulders who have symbolically been a talisman to me throughout my personal journey that has brought me here to Newark for such a time as this in my life. On this journey, I encountered Araminta, better known to us as Harriet Tucker, as seen through the eyes of poet Eloise Greenfield in her poem, Harriet Tubman. She writes, Harriet Tubman didn't take no stuff, wasn't scared of nothing either, didn't come into this world to be no slave and wasn't going to stay one either. In another stance of Greenfield wrote, 19 times she went back south to get 300 others. She ran for her freedom 19 times to save black sisters and brothers. Harriet Tubman didn't take no stuff. Wasn't scared of nothing either. Didn't come into this world to be no slave and didn't stay one either. As we know, after her death, Tubman was framed as one of those well-behaved women and relegated to the ranks of children's literature, a bigger-than-life legend in the eyes of a little girl like me who grew up hearing about Tubman and the Underground Railroad. And I will just pose a disclaimer, I haven't seen the movie. But scholars, historians, and biographers agree that much like the Abe Lincoln story, Tubman's story needed a new rendition too. Kate Clifford Larson said it best in her biography of Tubman, and I quote, she should be remembered in all of her full dimensions, as a mother, as a daughter, as a wife who got replaced, and a woman who later married a man 20 years younger than she was. As history's rendition of Tubman changed, we better understand why one well-behaved woman was able to capture imaginations by demonstrating that she could impact so many lives and defy limitations of any characterizations imposed upon her. But let me get to this idea 
of what I mean by a well-behaved woman. I don't know if you're familiar with the origin of the phrase, this phrase, well-behaved women seldom make history. The phrase actually originated with historian Laura Thatcher Ulrich in 1976. And it became so popular that it was often used in context that only women who break the rules and push the boundaries will make the history. Actually, Ulrich's phrase flowed from a scholarly <coughs> article that she wrote about the funeral sermons of Christian women from different periods of time in pre-revolutionary America. And she wrote about the intersection of their stories along with their scholarly struggle. Ulrich, who was Mormon, subsequently wrote a book titled by the same name. She challenged her fellow historians, and ultimately us, to do better at making history, at finding history. She said, do a better job of looking for conventional women who fade into the past. She breaks down the conventional stereotypes a good girl, bad girl, while showing that women, and men too, are complex, multi-dimensional beings, and that we too, like Harriet Tubman, defy limitations of one-dimensional characterizations. Over the years, that phrase became politically popular and was often used in the context that women who break the rules and push the boundaries, you know those fierce women, will make history. You find this phrase appropriated to so-called bad girls and iconic and historic figures like queens, queens like Cleopatra, Nefertiti, Elizabeth in the Bible, or Esther, Queen Elizabeth and Esther in the Bible, I'm sorry. All women who were perceived to push the boundaries and rules because of their potential authority and power. But before I go on, let me make an important distinction about the power of women. By using this metaphor found in the game of chess, one of the oldest and most popular games in the world. In the game of chess, the queen is able to play the role of every other piece on the board when and if she needs to. So the intersectionality of the queen with all the other players in chess is illustrated by her ability to play the role of every other piece on the board if she needs to and when the time calls for it. The queen is able to move across boundaries mm -hmm. and beyond the one-dimensional characterization of her defined role because if needed, she can move like a pawn in a straight line. If called for, the queen can move vertically and horizontally like the castle. If she has to, she can move on a diagonal like the bishop and the rook. And if need be, she can move in an L shape like a knight. The queen is powerful. And we know that even with all of this exceptionalism, our history and the history of this game, but that's another sermon, another lecture, <coughs> revealed to us that even queen need a little help every now and then. So Ulrich, when she wrote this book, wasn't really referring to just the so-called bad girls, historical icons and queens of such. No, she was challenging her fellow historians to do a better job of finding history among ordinary women and stop looking at what she termed exceptional women of history. Instead, she asserted that women can make history in any role, and we need to be more intentional about looking for women's history that is all around us. She encourages us to look at ordinary women and look at their lives because, after all, ordinary women are queens, too. They are poised and empowered to make individual differences whatever they choose. Although you may not even know how to play chess, I suspect that we all know some sisters and brothers too that just feel like pawns 
than somebody else's game. You know that feeling like someone else is always in control of your moves. You see so many women go through life just seeking approval <coughs> for everything they do. They're always looking for approval. Do you think I'm good enough? Do you think I'm pretty enough? Are my hips big enough? Is my hair straight enough? Is it okay if I do that? Or maybe you know someone or you are someone who feels like the knight, always in the midst of battle. Always defending yourself because you're misunderstood and wrestling with the distortions of competitive conversations that are grounded in the black and whites of life, the either and ors of life, and the have and have nots of life. You know, like Miss Sophia in Alice Walker's The Color Purple. Miss Sophia was such a strong-minded and physically strong woman who felt like she was always in the middle of a battle. I just happened to run into her and Miss Seeley on my Sankofa journey. And they said to let you know that for most of their lives, they felt like they were always fighting. Mm -hmm. And you know, even though Miss Sophia was such a strong woman, she told me that her soul was tired. She was tired of that. Or, like Miss Seeley told me, with her always quiet and passive self, unable to express herself except through her letters to God and to her sister, but she was always fighting. Miss Sophia and Miss Seeley, and Seeley's fights are all too familiar to many black women, along with women of all races, socioeconomic and cultural situations in life. Miss Sophia and Miss Silly suffered disproportionately like so many other women who are still suffering from the effects of misogyny, sexism, sexual assault and abuse, and domestic violence. And they too were faced with near impossible tough choices they had to make, even as well behaved women. I admit that as women, we have made extraordinary progress. And that's why we're celebrating this Women's History Month. Why, just a few weeks ago, everything looked so good and promising on those debate stages across the country. Now we sit in disappointment, shaking our heads, and asking ourselves, what happened? What happened this year to the dream that a woman may be on her way to the White House as President of the United States? What happened to those pinky promises? Well, we only have to look at what has been happening to that dream in the past because women have been trying to run for president since the 1800s. But I encourage all of us to hold on to hope and never give up that dream. I encourage you to use your voice and vote. In this election year, if there is anybody here who isn't registered to vote, please go do so. We need your vote. Newark needs your vote. I hear a lot of talk these days about a political revolution, but I believe in that revolution that Bishop Desmond Tutu dreamed about when he said, I long call for a revolution based on women. It's the last best hope to restore love and compassion and peace to the planet. And I have to admit that I conclude that based on my life's journey and the current state of affairs, of women's affairs, I agree with Bishop Tutu. I don't have any magic, but I do believe that we can do better at restoring love, compassion, and peace to this planet because of this one thing. I am confident that we won't do any worse than what is happening right now. I believe that women can become 
effective arbiters of justice and peace in our communities. If we continue embracing women's ways of knowing and working and honoring differences and not allowing our differences to keep us apart. And we will, just like the role of the queen in the chess game, continue to live out our roles as leaders, educators, innovators, advocates, <coughs> and peacemakers when we have to, just as we've always done. So as an educator, I ask myself, and I challenge others with this question, who are the children, the adolescents, the adults, that you are willing to reach back for 19 times so that they too may be free? How can we find our way back, like Harriet, in Greenfield's poem, 19 times to make a difference in someone else's life. I push my students to understand what it means to be in touch with their feelings and to uncover the hidden wholeness and paradoxes of what it means to teach young children. I challenge them to stretch beyond their comfort zones. I ask them as a learning community of female learners are we really our sister's keepers? Are we the Gloria Lats and Billings dream keepers? Who will be if not you and I? And if not now, when? I am more convinced than ever before that our capacity as women for hoping and dreaming for others is unbelievably unplatform. That conviction is affirmed by my St. Copa journey and my personal journey as I think about courageous and visionary women in my life, like my mother, my grandma, who is better known to the neighborhood as Mama Ida, and my other grandma, who was a pastor, known to many as an evangelist, and Mother V. These were community mothers. My Amy, and yes, we call them Amy when I grew up. You know Amy and them. I'm sure all of you have those relatives, afflicted kin, that you may know by other names as well. These are the women who made a mark on me and let me know that I had to do something, something meaningful in my life. These were the women, unbeknownst to me at that time, that offered up their dreams. Your dreams for me in so many ways and inspired me to never give up. This conversation is a tribute to those women and to all the mamas and the nanas and the big mamas and Madias and Amy's who offered up their dreams for you too. I also know that they're always with us and it's through their spirits and the courage, their courage, that we can continue to be encouraged to be the dream for someone else in this human experience. And just like them, we as ordinary queens are called to do extraordinary things in this human enterprise called life. We're called to do this work in a relational mode of interconnectedness. Our interconnectedness is through our perceptions about the realities of what it means to be a woman. That interconnectedness, like the chessboard, leads us to an ability to work with the whole and the parts simultaneously and synergistically to become ordinary women and men too who can move mountains. And remember, as queens, we have the power to move in all directions across the board when we must and when the time calls for us to do so. And the time is now. I'd like to share a little bit with you about a book that I really like. It's called, All oh, the Places You'll Go. And you may be familiar with this book because it's a Dr. Seuss book. And it's often used when children are about to make a new milestone. But you know what? I use picture books with adults. I use it in kindergarten and middle school and high school and college. And it's good to, to just look at 
what Dr. Seuss <coughs> has to say because there is a lot of wisdom in that little book. Now, I'm a Christian, but I don't know if Dr. Seuss was a Christian. I don't know if he went to church. I don't know if he believed in God or read the Bible, but it really doesn't matter because his little book is full of wisdom. If you haven't read it, I sure hope you will. It's the story of a little boy, which could easily be the story of a little girl, who is embarking on something new. And it begins with, congratulations, today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. Today is your day, ladies and gentlemen. You are off to great places, and that's why I'm having this conversation with you, you today. Yes, I'm talking to all of you, as a matter of fact, because today is your great day. You showed up, you're here. But what, I'm ta what I like about this story, too, that Dr. Seuss wrote, is that he's quite honest that there's going to be some trouble along the way that there are going to be some difficulties. Dr. Seuss says, you're going to be banged up and hanged up. And you're going to have slumps. There'll be times when you, you just have to wait. And you're going to be wondering, why do I have to wait? Why me? He also points out that there will be times when you'll be lonely and you'll be confused. And times when it feels very, very dark. But this is what he says. He says, never forget to be dexterous and deft, and never mix up your right foot with your left, and you will succeed. You will be 98 and 3 quarter percent guaranteed. Girl, you'll move mountains. And that's a message for all of us indeed. Now, obviously, I am not talking about physical mountains. I'm talking about those mountains you encounter when you feel like a failure. When it just seems like everyone but you is winning the race. And it would just be easier to give up, throw the towel in, call it quits. When you feel like you can't make it and you just don't want to do another thing. When you're tired, just remember that it's never a solo journey. We're interconnected in this human experience, and we're all about doing life together just as the Creator has planned it. Don't lose your faith, girl. Remember, you're capable of moving in all directions across that board of life, and don't ever forget in the power of reaching back. Don't forget the power of saying hope. Because unlike the women in Aldrich's book, you don't have to look for women who make history by looking through the obituaries. No, you just have to look to your left and look to your right because you're making history right now. Right now, just by being here today. I have a little bow here. I'm going to close with this. And I received this bow from my granddaughter. She's a fourth grader. And she goes to school in Minnesota. And during the month of African American history, her name is Sydney. And she's one of two little African American girls in her class. And she attends a language immersion school. And so she and her little friend in her class are accustomed to not seeing other girls who look like them. So they wanted to celebrate black girl magic. So what they did with the help of their mothers, of course, they put together a PowerPoint presentation. And they made these little bowls and they made some wonderful displays. And their teacher was so impressed that she asked them and moms if they could make this presentation to all of the grades within the school. So that has been going on since African American History Month. And this week, I think they made their final presentation. But you see, history is all around us. Through ordinary women and girls, because those two little black girls made history at their school. So girl, 
You will move mountains. Mountains of fear, mountains of doubt, insecurities, disappointment and pain. And oh, the places you will go. Thank you and God bless. Thank you guys.